If you have an iPad Pro that does not turn on, it's most likely having charging issues like this one. It's a very common fault where the charging port is damaged and it does not charge. What you do see sometimes is the charging symbol like this, but it doesn't detect the cable. This should actually turn on the meter to show that it's charging, but it doesn't. So in today's video, we're gonna open up this iPad and then see what's going on inside, including checking the charging port and making sure that the charging circuit is good. Now there's a chance it's a motherboard issue, but there's also a chance it's just a charging port. There's no way to know for sure until we open this up and see what's inside. Now this iPad specifically, this is a 12.9 fifth generation and it is a very expensive screen. So the repair is also very expensive because it's a high risk job. So I'm gonna show you guys my technique of opening these iPads using this heat pad and I will link to all my tools in today's video down below. Now, if you don't wanna try risking damaging your iPad, reach out to us through our website. We do offer mail-in service to repair all iPad issues, including charging ports, batteries, screens, even CPU reballs. So the link is down below. Also, if you wanna support the channel and these tutorials, buy yourself a sweater like this one, the Christmas sweater that I have. We also have other cool merch as well. So let's go ahead and get started with this repair. So the first thing we gotta do is check out what's going on with this iPad. So as you can see, I can sometimes get the charging symbol to show up. If I wiggle it at certain angles, that typically will tell you if it's the port. Now, not always. And this is a newer iPad Pro that has USB-C. So there's a, there's a high chance that the port is damaged. We see a ton of these at our shop. So if you wanna take a look under the microscope, you can kind of actually see the pins are slightly bent. It's really hard to tell from outside. We basically have to take the port out. So let's check the other side. And it definitely does look like damaged pins. Right there, you kind of see the pins. Now it does take some experience to know what to look for as far as what a damaged pins look like. Now I also have this new uh, mechanic uh, tester that tests both lightning and USB-C pins. Now I'm still learning how to use it specifically for diagnosing these issues. But when you plug it in, it scans all the pins and then it'll give you a readout of all the pins. So this one in particular gives us we see a few pins are in red, which I believe it means that they're probably abnormal readings. Now, um, you know, once we finish the repair, we'll run this test again and see how it compares. Now, a really common uh, thing people ask me is, is there a TriStar tester for these iPads? On older iPads with lightning port, we have this special tool called a TriStar tester that actually can scan the charging port and the TriStar, which is the charging controller of older iPads and it will tell you which one is bad and it's pretty accurate. Now, this does not work with USB-C iPads because USB-C has a whole different circuit. Uh, you cannot just get an adapter from Lightning to USB-C because it's, like I said, it's a whole different circuit. So it's just not compatible. This is not, does not know what to scan for on those pins. Now this one doesn't make any judgments per se. It just gives you readouts and then you have to figure out, you know, what is good and what is bad. So. This is just kind of for reference and we'll see how we can use this tool into the future for diagnosing uh, port issues. At this point, pretty much all we have left to do is to uh, open it up and see what's going on. So using my heat pad, we're gonna turn it on to 70 degrees Celsius and we're just gonna heat it up for a few minutes so it can get hot. Now, one thing a lot of people ask me is, um, you know, when heating it on the heat pad, do you face the screen down towards the heat or face it up? we use it facing up. And the reason is the, the frame is like metal, so it absorbs all the heat and it stays hot. So that makes it really easy to work on because this thing is sealed with really strong adhesive around the edges. So if you have constant heat, then it makes it really easy to open it up and keep attacking that adhesive that's on here. And the problem is <laughs> you gotta do it very carefully because there's a very tiny, tiny bezel that it's like maybe half an inch or so that you have clearance to insert your tool to separate it. And if you go in too deep, you're gonna damage the LCD. If you bend it too hard, you can crack the glass. So there's a lot of risk on this screen. And this screen specifically costs around $310. And that is my price as a repair shop. So it is not a cheap screen for this. And you don't wanna Especially if you have a bad charging port, you most likely have a good screen, but the charging port's bad. So if you need to get inside, 
you need to have the skills and the experience to open these. So if, if you're watching this and you're trying to do your own repair, I do warn you, it, is, it does take practice to kind of master this skill. Now it's up to you if you want to risk it. And like I said, we do offer screen repairs as well. So if you try it and you fail, we can charge you, you know, accordingly for the screen and the charging port. So some of the tools that I use for opening the iPads is suction cup. So I'll link to that down below. It is really nice because it grabs the screen and lets you lift it up. And then we use uh, this plastic kind of, I don't know what it's called. Well, it's called the iPlastics. They sell that at Mobile Centrix and any other uh, tool repair uh, supplier. There's different brands. Mobile Centrix is just a supplier that sells this one that they have it branded as themselves. You know, I got this one at uh, one of the expos from Phone LCD Parts. So there is literally the same tool. Now, if you don't want to buy this, you can get plastic playing cards or blank cards. Uh, I also use one of these. This is a metal tool, and this is what gives me the initial opening for getting inside the, the edges. Another thing is we use isopropyl alcohol with a needle tip dispenser, and this is very important because you want to be able to drop just a little bit of alcohol. You don't want to just spill a bunch. And the thing about using alcohol is if you use too much, you can get it on the LCD itself, the backlight, and then you destroy the screen that way as well. So there's a lot of risk, a lot of things going on here. Now I do know a lot of uh, repair shops use heat guns. That is super risky because usually those heat guns are crazy hot, like 500 degrees and, it, and you got to like heat it and then put it away, stop and work, and then heat it. And it's very risky. If you hold it for too long, you're going to burn the LCD. So the heat pad is the most uh, safest and I would say maybe the most efficient as well because it lets you keep working on opening the screen without uh, stopping whereas a heat gun you have to then stop reapply heat and then come back so uh, I think that's the main tools now some guitar picks as well uh, I use all kinds of different sizes you know I use these thicker ones to uh, once I open it then I slide it in between to hold the screen open keep that Kind of upward pressure just to so it doesn't sit back down and allows me to keep going around the edges so we've been here for a few minutes now i could feel the screen on top is getting warm now we want it hot to the touch the thing about this heat pad also is that even though i put it at 70 uh, it can overshoot the temperature that you set so sometimes it'll even go to 100 and i don't know why exactly but eventually it'll overshoot it and then slowly come back down to the temperature set and essentially it'll eventually just stay around the 70 or whatever setting you put all right at this point it does feel pretty hot especially in the edges so we're good so we're ready to start now this one specifically does have a screen protector uh, we are typically able to open these up without removing the screen protector although it's very important to also just inspect the edges of the screen, make sure the glass itself is not cracked. When the glass, the actual screen glass, not the screen protector is cracked, that adds uh, uh, some extra complexity because that crack, if you put any pressure on it, it's just gonna shatter the whole screen. So when it's all solid, it's less likely to crack. So uh, up here is the power button, here's the face ID sensors, there's the ALS sensors here as well. On this specific model, I believe this side will have a flexes from the screen within itself. Uh, and then the screen flexes, I believe, are also somewhere around here. So you gotta be aware of what's underneath this glass so when you're inserting your tools, you don't damage anything. So I'm gonna start off on this side. I'm gonna do a suction cup down, then I go straight down between the glass and the frame and then when I get my tool you can see this tool stuck on there I like to drip some ISO so maybe like two three drips and then I start tilting the glass pulling up and then tilting the tool like this and then a few more drops and then I like to drip along the the whole frame at least the top side and I can see my tool has entered. You guys can see that? Then I get one of these and essentially replace the metal tool with the plastic one. Plastic one uh, reduces the risk of breaking the glass because it's a lot more flexible. And what I like to do is just kind of try to 
slice through the adhesive while still pulling up. Now once you have like a pretty good entry, you got to feel for that ALS sensor. You cannot see it, but it's somewhere around here. I could feel it. I could bump it here. Now if you bump it too hard, you could damage the flex and then cause face ID not to work. So I hope keep that in mind. Now depending on how big the gap you have, you can then insert a, a thin tool. That helps basically keep the screen separated while you come in and work on down the road. So I gotta unhook this and then gently push it down just to get that suction. And then I can go and try to slice through the rest of the adhesive. And the goal is to kind of open this top side and then decide to want to go down this way or go up this way. Depending on which side it kind of comes off first or comes off easier. I do see from the top, you guys can see that adhesive right there. So basically what I'm doing is kind of just sticking my tool in between to separate it. Now one other tool I forgot to mention is my little scissors. So when I see like a string of adhesive that is sticking from the glass to the frame, I like to just go in there and snip it. All right, so I'm just lifting it up so you guys can see. I normally don't lift it up like that. So I'm hoping it doesn't fall. All right, so I got a pretty big gap there. So what I'm gonna do is insert my tool enough so that it stays open. So I have half the guitar pick in there. I wonder if I could actually play guitar with one of these. That'd be cool. All right, so that side's pretty open. I'm gonna drip some more ISO here and put my suction cup over here and then just gently, I wanna find, uh, I could feel I had basically found a spot between the adhesive and the frame. So it allows me to slice through it. And then you just gotta be careful with that ALS sensor that's on that side as well. And I'm gonna insert my tool here. I do see some adhesive. Now when you can see the adhesive in here, you can even drop like a drop or two and it'll just dissolve that adhesive. And then I'm gonna go in just be real careful because one of these flexes can be the face ID flex and you don't want to uh, cut that. All right. So I got a big gap right here. So you basically just keep shoving things in there until you can, uh, now just be careful with the face ID sensors. Here's where I go with the little thicker uh, guitar pick thing so I can hold it and then this one can kind of move out of the way. And then I could rotate the iPad. And then I'm just gonna, what I like to do is go like in a movement. That way it doesn't all concentrate in one spot. I'm gonna use my, twe oh, there it goes. I like to use my tweezers whenever I wanna disconnect the suction cup. Now one thing, common mistake is people who are entering this corner will start trying to lift the corner. And what happens is you start separating the glass from the LCD and you're gonna get a bunch of bubbles here. So I basically just skip that part, work on the side. And as the side keeps opening, then this will just automatically kind of detach itself. Now, right now I could actually see there's like a adhesive there. So if I drop, just a single drop on there will dissolve a lot of it. And what happens is since the iPad is hot, the alcohol will dissolve before it reaches the LCD. And then I do see some adhesive here. I'm trying to snip. Basically the adhesive either, oh, there it goes. You can either slice through it or a little bit of alcohol to release it. Look at that. You can see how much of my tool. 
So I'm already under the LCD, under the glass. And I do see a piece here. So I'm going to do a single drop. And then the heat and the ISO will soften it. And I'm just basically, I'm constantly doing upward pressure on this. And then using like, I use my thumb and then you can see I'm basically going like this. So my thumb helps control how, how deep I go in. I just want it like very little amount. I don't even know the measurement. And then just the suction cup comes off. I basically just push down real gentle. There's other stuff pushing up like the guitar picks. Okay, so I'm gonna move this over here. Now you can see where I'm at. You can see right here is like some tension. Like right here is where it is still connected. But since we're only like an inch upward pressure is not gonna damage the screen. Now if there was cracked glass somewhere around here, then that could potentially shatter it. So uh, you have to approach it a little bit different on those. Right, I can feel when I'm putting my tool, there's no, uh, it doesn't move nicely. So that tells me the alcohol has evaporated or it's just not there. So I just got to kind of come back and do that. I'm also uh, moving my guitar pick, the thick one, kind of closer that way. So it's also having a little bit of upward pressure. It's constantly doing that. I can see on this side right here, there's still some adhesive on there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna snip the adhesive only. Be careful, there's LCD flex, flex cables there. All right, so I would say this side is pretty much lifted up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back to this side. And then I'm just gonna use that opening to get in and then I'm gonna just skip trying to get the adhesive out of here and then just start on this side. Cause like I said, you wanna not put any pressure on that corner so you don't get bubbles on that glass. And I'm not feeling any lubrication, so to speak. So now I'm doing the exact same thing just on this side. Also uh, using gloves really helps a lot with the heat. You know, these heat pads get really hot and then the devices get really hot. So gloves, even if it's just like a, a micron worth of space between your hand and the, the heat, it does help tremendously as far as how much heat your hand can handle before it starts like burning. All right, so I have, I'm gonna gently try to slice through here with minimal alcohol just because that LCD underneath the glass is like way close to the edge. So it looks like there's a lot of gap, a lot of space here, but it's actually, the LCD sticks out way out. So just keep that in mind. I have a lifted up, oh, suction cup came loose. So gently press down and then start pulling up. And then just, I'm also angling this downwards. So I'm not gonna hit the LCD if I do go in too far. I actually can see that adhesive here. And there's actually a little, there's like a little tab here. Let me swap out the guitar pick with this thick one. Even then, there's like a little tab here that you can basically just break. Uh, I think it's off. 
Then here on the side, I'm just gonna go like that, help uh, disconnect what I can. And then let's lay this back down. And I got that corner up. So now this whole section is disconnected. You can see I have, I don't know if you can see that, but basically I'm, I'm all disconnected up here and all of this. So they just will keep working our way down. We just keep rotating the iPad so it's in a more comfortable position. Just gently press down and then pull up. And then we just gently drag our tool. Once you feel that tension, that's where the screen and the frame are meeting. We're gonna put a little bit more alcohol. Okay, so I'm gonna see if I can slide my guitar pick a little further down. And I do see a piece of adhesive in here. I'm gonna snip that. I do see some adhesive in here. And then sometimes you get lucky and you can just literally just slice through the whole thing and then easily lift the screen off. But a lot of times this adhesive is very gooey. So right now what I'm actually doing is pushing the LCD that way since the left side is already uh, disconnected, it allows me to push the LCD to the side, which then lets me get a little better entry into the frame and drip some ISO to help uh, disconnect or dissolve some of that adhesive. Yeah, there you go, I snipped a piece there. Now just be very mindful where what you're cutting. You don't wanna cut the actual flex cables. So this is what I'm looking for. See how there's a piece from the top connected to the bottom. I'm essentially snipping and now that releases the screen. By the way, this is an OEM sealed iPad. So most iPads you'll see out there are gonna be OEM sealed. If it's been previously repaired, it makes this so much easier because it's never gonna be as strong as the OEM adhesive. Now my guitar pick. Then go inside. All right, I'm gonna put it around here. Now one thing also is the screen is so large that you don't wanna put your guitar pick too far and then the screen is bending that way and then you could damage the LCD. So just keep that in mind, the weight of the screen is gonna be a lot of pressure on this side pushing down. And if you have the guitar picks too far, you're essentially folding it that way. So once you have it, I pretty much have all three sides. You can see how I can just bounce it up and down. You could actually move these back up just for specifically that reason. So it's a little more, not too much pressure on the top side. And then just like the other sides. Now this one, we could also start uh, doing the same thing with that at the top suction cup and then use the metal tool to lift it up. And then lifting it up gives me room to enter with some ISO, which then is gonna make it really easy to lift and insert my tool. All right, so now I'm at the bottom. Now the bottom has a lot less flex cables, like there's no face ID down here. So it's usually a little easier. As you can see, the heat mat is always on. So what that's doing is it's providing constant heat for uh, you know, softening the adhesive. Now I do got an opening there and I was able to get that guitar pick. Now it does feel a little rough. So adding ISO helps kind of lubricate it, so to speak. So then you can You can also do sawing motions 
Like uh, over here, there's still some adhesive, so I'm just going left and right. Barely, my tool is barely entering underneath glass. And the question is, where is the... Okay, I see the adhesive here. There's like a little piece. So I'm gonna snip that. And there's a little piece here. Now on this side, I can see this piece here of adhesive. So I'm just gonna, a little bit of slice in action. And there we go. Now that we have uh, all three sides and some of the bottom, we can actually move it sideways up and out. Like the frame is staying uh, steady and then I'm pushing out. And then I can drip ISO on the actual adhesive there. And then the hot frame will evaporate. Oh look, there's a piece here I can cut. It's hard to do while I'm trying to show you guys. All right, there's, oops, so it doesn't fall. Snip that, snip that. And we're pretty much done. Not all the way, but almost. Now be careful, don't ever lift the screen once you got all the sides. There's a cable, a short cable at the top that you need to release as well. But we're pretty much there. All right, there's a, I'm gonna drip a little bit, a little bit here. That should be enough to, or not. So we gotta try to disconnect. There's like a little piece here that's like stuck. And it's always this part that gets me a little nervous. All right, there it goes, I can feel it. The glass is no longer on the frame, but there's adhesive. And if I snip, oh, there it goes, we're off. So what I like to do once I got all the sides is put guitar picks on each corner. That way, the screen is physically disconnected from the frame. So guitar pick, guitar pick, then you can see we have a separation there. Now, uh, heat pad we no longer need, so we can turn it off. All right, so the next step is to actually lift the screen. But like I said, there's a flex cable here. So you gotta gently, let me scoot this over that way. You gotta gently shift this downwards enough to expose the connector here. So using my fancy Rewa Refox screwdrivers, I'm going to kind of just put it there. Let's get these screws out and then put that there. Once we got that, we can then pop this flex off. Now we can actually lift the screen and then you got to tilt it like that. All right, so now we're inside. Now one thing about this is now, uh, let's get these guitar picks out. Now we have it open, we have to get to the connectors, to the screws. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay my magnet mats here. I need a lift. There's this giant thing here. that covers the connectors, and then we can go and unscrew all this. I'm holding the screen with my left hand. Now you can technically lay it down, although I'm always, always get a little nervous, especially with the screen this expensive. I don't mind holding it for a little bit. I 
always, always, always keep track of the screws. Do not mix up the replacement. If you mix them up, you're risking long screw damage. Now to unplug the screen, use a spudger to just pop these off. And if you're screaming at the screen right now because I did it without unplugging the battery, uh, then you are not aware of how this all works. So battery is plugged in, but there's no issue with unplugging connectors. The issue is when there's the battery plugged in and you're trying to plug in the screen after because there's live voltage on these, on these connectors on some of them. So the issue is when you're trying to plug in the screen with live voltage there and you're not getting the alignment perfect, what happens is uh, you're gonna move it around and bridge pins together unintentionally. And that's where you can blow the backlight or cause a short and cause other problems. Unplugging it, you're just disconnecting. So it's not gonna do anything. All right, so here, let me show you the screen up close. The top is the proximity flex with the face ID stuff, the ALS sensors here. Really common thing to happen is, is to damage these sensors when trying to open the screen and just damaging these can cause no face ID. Now I heard a rumor that you can just replace this flex and get face ID back. Personally, I haven't tried that, so I don't know for sure. Another thing you can do that I have confirmed, if you did damage one of these sensors, these are the ALS sensors, there's two. So you, if you can visually spot like a flex that's damaged, like essentially imagine you hit the flex like this and you kind of like damage the part where the sensor meets the flex, that can cause the issue. So you essentially you snip off the whole thing. So, you know, the sensor comes this way and goes out. If you just cut that off, you could fix it just by removing it. There's also a sticker here that you can then expose the solder joints and essentially re-solder a new flex if you want to re-add the ALS sensors. So on this side of the screen, there are just some magnets. On this side, this is where I was saying is there's some flex cables that kind of fold within this itself. And these are the ones you want to avoid damaging. Now looking at these, you can see I did not damage them, especially because I was using a plastic tool that reduces the chance of cutting that flex. If you're using a metal tool, that's where you can really cause damage. All right, that's just the glue that's there. That's from the screen. I'm just pushing that back. As you can see, this is how much room you have from the glass edge to the LCD. And look at the corner. You basically have like half of what this is, it seems like, especially like right here. So this is what I'm saying is don't focus too much on the corners. Also, you could push this adhesive back. Now, one nice thing about these iPads is you can reuse that adhesive. Essentially, just lay it back down, and this adhesive works really well. Um, it's like really reusable. All right, so this is lines you straighten it out. So having a microscope does help with a lot of these repairs. Even if you don't micro solder, think about um, how helpful it would be to see the actual little string of adhesive right there. I love dog hairs. Yeah, on this side, there's not much you can really damage. Right. This adhesive, you can fix. Just laying it back to where it belongs. And then here's that little thing that, just like a sticker, it doesn't really do anything. So you could technically just snip this off or just push it back. Here's the sensor. Here's where I was saying your tool can enter and damage it. This thing is another part of that sticker. It does nothing. So I'll deal with that later. And then I 
Now, one thing is this adhesive is to hold the screen down. It is not for water resistance. So don't, uh, don't go swimming in your pool with your iPad and expect it not to, expect it to survive underwater. But yeah, this uh, screen physically looks good, but we don't know until after we repair this. So now that we got uh, the screen removed, let's take off the battery screw. One thing about the battery screw, it has to be a very specific length. If you put a, too, a screw too long for here, what's gonna happen is the screw is not gonna pull the board down to the battery. It's gonna keep a little gap and that's gonna cause charging issues as well. So just keep that in mind. So one of the first things to check on here is the charging port. So let me unplug that. There's two screws that hold it in. Now also a very common thing we see here a lot is that people will pry damage a MOSFET that's right next to the connector. When you're doing this, you gotta just be real careful. Don't dig down. Just try to gently go under the connector and pop it off like that. And I'll show you under the microscope uh, what the issue is could be. And then you peel it off. Now this thing has a really strong adhesive on here. So a little bit of ISO will help soften it. So this is what the port looks like. Oh yeah, there you go. Look at those pins. So that's why it's not charging. See how those two at the bottom are touching each other? That's not good. <laughs> Let's flip it over. Oh boy, yeah, look at that. So that will definitely cause charging problems. Another thing that can happen is these bridging together can actually send, you know, high voltage to a lower voltage system and cause a, cause a problem. Essentially, you can short out the charging IC because these pins are bridging together and then you now have to fix the board as well. So one of the first things we can do to confirm that we fixed it is just try a new charging port. So it just, something you just gotta do it and see if it works. Now these charging ports are a little weird. They have like a little bend to them. Take a look at the original. Just like the little dip right here. The replacements have that dip, but it's not as pronounced. You can kind of see. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna be a little too long. So what you gotta do is essentially bend it. So it is so it basically lets you line it up. Now, before I peel out the stickers to stick this on, I'm just gonna do a dry fit test. Just be careful with the alignment also. You don't wanna damage the connector. All right, so I ended up just playing it in first and then folding the cable back in. Let me put the two screws in place. And if you remember the symptoms from before, the meter was not turning on and it was not charging. So what we can do right now is just, all we need is just the battery and the USB meter. We don't necessarily need the screen yet. All right, so I have that plugged in. I'm gonna plug in the meter. Now this is really when we know if we have an issue with the charging circuit, like on the board level. So I'm gonna plug it in. and give it a second. We do have 15 volts, that's a really good sign. And yeah, we have two point something amps, totally in 32 watts. That's a really good sign. That tells us all we needed was a port. Now you do wanna give it a few minutes, you wanna make sure it stays charging and it keeps working. A common issue is it'll charge and then eventually it will stop charging and then you have more problems. But yeah, look at that, we're getting 30 watts. Now the charging brick I'm using is a 45 watt charger and it's a legit charger. I, on my old Samsung, I was getting 45 watt charging. So make sure you got a proper charging brick that supports USB PD so you can get the higher wattage charging. If you don't have the right charger, you're not gonna get 15 volts and you're not gonna get uh, two amps totaling you know, 30 watts. So this looks like it's fixed. Now I gotta actually install it with uh, removing that adhesive. 
Now I could have technically, uh, you know, installed it properly, but sometimes you never know if there's other issues. So I don't want to stick it on there and then we have other issues. All right, let me show you the common thing we see here. So very common tool damage is actually right here. So what you should do is get a flat enough tool and gently pop it off like that. All right, I got the port out. Here's that adhesive thing. Let me get rid of that. All right, so if you didn't notice, there's a sticker here. If you peel that up, there's a bunch of components. So we've seen a ton of these after a repair shop tried a new port. What happens is they'll break this MOSFET off and that is part of the charging circuit. Uh, we've also seen some of these break off as well because people go in real hard to come and disconnect it and essentially damage all these and then you have to replace them from a donor board. So, you know, a lot of times you get ripped pads, which is a, is a big nightmare. So repair shops, be real careful when unplugging this. Apple set up this booby trap, basically. Um, other, I guess another way is to come in from the side. There's no components on the sides, so maybe do that. So let me install this port again. So what I did originally was plug it in first and then fold it down, get it into the port, get it over the plates, and then we're gonna screw it in permanently. All right, so one thing Let's see, can we pop this off from the side? Now this thing has a sticker there, which is not necessary. All right, we don't need that. But can you, unplug yeah, you can unplug it from the side. So yeah, if, if your repair shop come in from the side, I think the other side should work too. Yeah, that should work. So just be careful with that. You know, this is screwed in, it's glued down and this should be a really solid repair. Now, we gotta fully reassemble it. So, the thing about these is, you know, the, the risky part is plugging in the screen after you do a repair. So what I like to do is drip some ISO in there, and then you wanna separate the board from the battery. The battery is underneath, the connector is underneath the flat connector. This is a board on top, and essentially the screw connects them together. Now this side is held down by this little plate here. And another tip is do not insert a tool underneath. I see a million repair shops, they'll insert a tool underneath the battery connector and then they call us to repair their battery connector because they damage the pins. The trick here is go from the side. The goal is to disconnect the battery by creating space between the pins and the battery. You don't need to go physically between the pins and the battery. Just, you just need enough to create that gap to disconnect it. So you can see the board is essentially lifted up and then they're not making contact. And that's all you really need. You just need a little bit of air in between. So let's see, what do we gotta do? We gotta plug in the screen, put in the plates, so what I like to do is, let's see if you guys can see. Oh, another common thing is people will rip these flexes. So they'll unplug one and then somehow rip the flex between them. It's a really weird uh, kind of layout. So just be careful with that. Uh, here's the next one. Since the battery is unplugged, uh, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, shorting out the backlight. Now that it's plugged in, we can unplug this or remove that, come in and put all the screws in. Now to make my life a little bit easier, I'm gonna use a giant $50 board holder. It's really heavy. I'm gonna place it back here. And then I'm gonna use that as a stand to hold the screen open. So I bought that board holder originally uh, seven years ago or so, whenever I first started micro soldering, and I thought I was gonna use it for actual holding boards. Turns out, it does not work. It's way too tall, like where you attach the boards, 
it's about four inches off the bench. So essentially, uh, it's way out of the focal range of the scope. You know, it, it's just one of those tools that it looked like it would make sense, like, oh, that's the board holder, and it turns out it was not. But it works really well for a screen holder. It's super heavy, so you can lean anything against it, and uh, it'll keep it standing up. All right, so I'll put the LCD screws. And then the last two screws go after we lay the screen down. So I'm gonna flip this back down like that. Now this, I don't know why it's there. I guess a thermal pad, who knows? But it's not gl really glued in or anything. It's kind of just laying there. So anytime you peel this off, good luck getting it to stay in place. So that's why I just fold it halfway and it, and it gives you enough now, if you do need to take the board out, then obviously you just have to pull it off. Sometimes you use a double-sided tape or Kapton tape to just keep it down, just so they get it back. But technically, it doesn't even need to be there. All right, and then the this one here, we can plug it in with the battery plugged in. It doesn't really matter. Let's see, plug that in. There it goes. Felt it click. Lay the screen down gently like that. The, the cable is going to look really nasty as far as you're going to be worried it's damaged. Like it's really weird, laying really weird, but it's fine. Never had any issues doing it this way. And there's literally no other, other way to do it. So keep that in mind, put the little plate uh, and then put the screws. And if you notice, I keep track of the layout of the screws. All right, everything's screwed down, everything's in place. Now, before I actually seal it down, what I'm gonna do is put the guitar picks on the corners. That way it doesn't glue itself back down unintentionally. All right. Let's see, do we have proper charging? 15 volts, low battery symbol. Funny thing about these USB-C iPad Pros, and they, de they detect the orientation even in low battery state like that. So it'll show you the sideways, oh look at that. Sideways Apple logo. If you're holding it up, then it'll be the other orientation. So yeah, look at that. 34 watts. Oh, we got some boot screen. We got 1% battery. So let's test this out. Check the brightness. So now let's pull up a white screen so we can see if we damaged the LCD. So it is in dark mode. It's really hard to tell if there's any damages to the screen this way. So switch to light mode. And then you can see there's no damage anywhere as far as the backlight, the LCD it looks perfect. Now there is some wear and tear on the screen itself, but that's uh, not related to what we did. There's like little random pieces here. So touch we can test by just swiping up and down and then going left and right. And you can see that the touch doesn't stop even if I'm on the sidebar. So that means touch is working. So pretty much this is good to go. Oh, you can see true tone is there. Um, you know, nothing happened to the screen. So this is why this takes, you know, years of practice to master this type of skill to open these so if you're trying to learn to do this yourself hopefully this video helped uh oh yeah you know what let's check the usb-c um pin reader so i'm gonna wake it up uh it's gonna be testing and i feel like it's slightly different i do see those four reds at the corners i think that was already there but i did take a picture of before so you can see there's an extra 0.19 here, whereas right now it doesn't. Also the other one right there too, 0.19. All right, let's compare the two and you see the difference. On the right is before, on the left is now. You can see on the left, pin three has a reading, whereas uh, pin 10 has a reading, pin uh, 14, 15 have a reading, and pin 23 have a reading, whereas before it did not. So definitely this does help kind of see where 
there could be issues. I would expect this reading to be the same for all iPad Pro 12.9 fifth gen, whether the fourth gen, third gen, and the other USB-C iPads will get the same readings that is yet to be determined. But hopefully we can start mapping these out. Maybe we'll make a repair wiki article mapping out the known good readings. Then we can use that for diagnosis. So now that we've confirmed this iPad is good to go, now it's time to seal it. Now I did kind of push back all the glue or the adhesive back to kind of where it would belong on the screen. Like I do see a piece here. I'm just gonna try to lay it where the glass is. And just basically get rid of all the guitar picks. And then the key is aligning the face ID at the top. All right, so this is aligned. Gently go around the edges, pushing it down. Now, trust me, we fix hundreds if not thousands of iPads where we just reuse the OEM adhesive and never had an issue. The only time we've ever really had an issue where we just reuse that adhesive is when the screen has been previously replaced or the iPad is bent really bad. Uh, you'd be surprised how resilient these iPads are as far as bending. Uh, typically, I don't see that uh, as a good sign for an iPad to be bent, but they somehow work. Maybe because the components are so spaced out, but who knows. Now, one final touch up before we call this completed is there are some pieces of adhesive that kind of come out, like for example here. So what I like to do is since we, since it's not practical to reopen and push it underneath, just slice it off, slide your blade, and then there it goes, it's gone. So if we just go around the edges, any adhesive that's sticking out, that is visible with the naked eye, not under the microscope, but with the naked eye, you can go in and slice it off like that. Now there's some here. What you do is push it out that way, and just slice with your blade, and it's gone. There's gonna be enough adhesive overall so that if you know the one two percent that you snipped off is gone it's not going to affect the overall strength of the ipad you know adhesive the screen adhesive i guess you can call it and then a little bit of cleaning with the isopropyl alcohol and a cloth should be more than enough to clean off all the adhesive that kind of over that spilled over the edges that will make the frame sticky now here's a piece here. Although that one's clear, so that won't be an issue. What I like to do is just kind of just roll, roll the adhesive off the edge. Another thing you can do to strengthen the adhesive, put it on the heat mat so the iPad is hot and then clamp it using the, you know, when it's hot and you clamp it, when it cools down, it'll grab it much better. So we do that sometimes whenever the Adhesive is a little worn out, especially like an older iPad. Sometimes the adhesive is a little weaker. Worst case, you could also use B7000 to do a few dots around the perimeter to help uh, keep it down as well. And then lastly, a little bit of cleaning, a clean cloth. This is isopropyl alcohol. It does not uh, damage anything. Clean the screen. Now, if there is adhesive on the screen, it's gonna smear it. So just keep that in mind. We also like to clean the LCD a little bit so that when the customer gets it back, it just looks nicer than if it was all dirty. Now this, this screen is pretty scratched up. So there's that. And then to clean the adhesive on the frame, just get some ISO on the rag and then just kind of wipe it down just rub it down it'll fall apart it's very minimal so you won't uh it'll get absorbed into the towel and then with ipads usb-c ipads uh, they all have face id so that's another important thing to test uh, i should have probably tested that before i sealed it otherwise it's gonna be a real pain to open it up again but i would basically just redo the same steps uh, you'd be surprised how difficult it is to reopen one of these. So let's test face ID. Now it works.
Graphics, Cancel, Camera. Don't forget there's a 1X. Oh, the battery died. Oh man. <laughs> All right, well, I'll finish testing after this video, but as you can see, um, let's see. Now, one of the downsides to this USB meter is a lot, it's a little bit thicker than the iPad itself. So when you lay it down, it's gonna cause a little bit of pressure on the port. So I have a separate USB meter that it kind of puts it on a little extension cable. And when you plug this in, it, you can lay it flat and it won't be an issue. And then you can still see the meter has uh, 33 watts charging. So yeah, this thing seems to be working. All right, so 1X, 05X, selfie cam. I'm holding it upside down, so it's a little weird. But yeah, this is all ready to go. So let me know down below in the comments what you guys learned from today's video as far as repairing on iPad. This one, you know, the bulk of the video is probably just opening the screen, but as you can see, the technique is very easy once you kind of understand the process. Uh, get yourself one of these heat mats. If you're using a heat gun right now, throw that thing away and get a heat mat, but just kidding, probably keep it because it can kind of come in handy for other repairs. Uh, let me know down below in the comments how you guys do the iPad screen removals. And then hopefully you guys kind of learn how to diagnose iPads with USB-C using the USB meters. So I'll link to all the tools, the meters, the heat pad, the, the little mechanic uh, tester, all that stuff down below in the video description. If you like these videos where I show you guys how to do these repairs, do me a huge favor and get yourself some merch like this one, like this ugly Christmas sweater that you can wear for Christmas at your Christmas parties. Join my locals community as well. I'll link that down below. We have, a, we have two different solder courses, a beginners and a more advanced that even cover data recovery. Appreciate all you guys who stuck around here to the end. Uh, check out the video down below where I show you guys how to open a regular iPad. I believe it's an iPad Air. Thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one.